Hello. <laughs> um, welcome to Coffee and Crime. I'm Stephanie, the adult program uh, adult programming coordinator. And tonight we're talking with Captain Craig Collier, uh, arson investigating unit officer with the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division. Thank you for joining us tonight. Absolutely. My pleasure. Um, tonight we're going to be discussing arson and the book American Fire. Um, just for those who haven't read the book, American Fire is about an engaged couple who starts over 70 fires in Accomack County, Virginia. Uh, the arsonists targeted abandoned buildings, but there were too many of them in the community, so the fires just continued to overpower the already exhausted firefighters and police. Uh, vigilante groups sprang up patrolling the rural Virginia coast with cameras and camouflage. Uh, volunteer firefighters had to sleep at their stations. Uh, the community became very suspicious of each other. And finally, um, the surprise when the couple was caught and the story about why they even set the fires to start with. Um, and so that's just a little bit about the book. Um, before we go to Captain Collier, uh, since we can't have coffee in person, you can get your coffee by asking a question. Uh, so if you have any questions for um, us or comments, please put it in the comments and you will be entered to win a gift card from Ninja Warrior Coffee House. Um, and we will select that person um, at the end of tonight's episode. So with all of that said, Captain Collier, thanks again for joining us. Um, Tell us a little bit about yourself and your experience with arson. Okay. Uh, my name is Craig Collier. I'm a captain with the state police with SLED, the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division. I've been a police officer for about 25 years. I've been at SLED since 2001, and I've been an arson investigator since 1998 when I was with the York County Sheriff's Office. Um, I got hired with SLED in 2001 as an arson investigator. And I worked as an investigator until 2007 when I got promoted to lieutenant. I left the arson unit for a few years. Um, went to Charleston to work in a low country regional office as an, invest as an investigative uh, supervisor. I was there for about three years. I went to narcotics for about two years. And in 2012, um, our chief asked me to come back to arson and run the unit as a lieutenant. So I was an arson lieutenant for about seven or eight years. And in 2018, I got promoted to captain. So currently I'm in charge of the arson investigation unit, our sled bomb squad, and our maritime enforcement, or the maritime unit, our dive team. Um, so yeah, <laughs> you have a lot of job responsibilities. I do, really. stay pretty busy, yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, so uh, the author said that the, in this book, specifically, the Accomack County being isolated was a factor in the arsons. Um, in what way are rural and isolated counties tailor-made for arsonists? Um, well, you know, arson is a, is a crime. Most of the arsons that we work are, are occur after dark, um, under the cover of darkness, because you're less likely to get caught in the middle of the night setting a fire than you are in the broad daylight, is for obvious reasons. Um, in isolated rural areas, you know, you're not going to have as many police officers in those areas. You're not going to have as many firefighters in those areas. So the fire's most likely going to get out of get out of control before it's observed or before it's witnessed to begin with. You set a fire in downtown at two o'clock in the afternoon, you're going to have to see it very quickly, and it's not going to do the damage it's intended to do. Um, so that's that's a not just a unique to arson. A lot of crimes take place in isolated areas at, at nighttime for the various reasons they don't want to get caught and you have less people awake at night and less witnesses at night. Yeah. So it's, it's not necessarily um, isolated to this incident. It's a That's lot correct. Of crime, most crimes. Um, yes. <laughs> just so you know, one, one Facebook uh, comment was that the book was good with a lot of details, but even more so while wow, you're a busy man. <laughs> <laughs> so, in your busy schedule and in, in your many years of arson investigation, has there been anything like the serial arson county that this book was written about that's happened here in South Carolina? There has. Um, actually, I've, I've investigated two serial arsonists. Um, the first one was much more involved. It was down in the little town of Walterboro. 
Oh. Um, and it's uh, between 2001, 2002, we had probably 25 or so fires in the small town of Walterboro, which is a lot for a town that small. Yeah. Um, so much so that uh, the poor fire chief ended up re retiring. He couldn't, he had, he couldn't do it anymore. He just, he, he kind of gave up and left. Um, we, early on, we had an idea of who was doing it. Um, we had some some people come forward and say they thought this individual was involved with the fires. Um, and finally, that many fires, we, were, we pretty much lived in Walterboro for that year and a half, two years, because we had, we'd have sometimes two or three fires a night. Um, so we actually, the, the, towards the end, we told the police, you know, stop going to the fires. When, when the fire call comes out, go to the area and stop anybody you see on foot or in a car within a five block radius, stop and see who they are, what they're doing. Well, the next fire they had, they did that very thing and they caught the guy we were thought it might be walking down an alley right down the road from where the fire had taken place. So um, we had enough to, to arrest him at that point um, based on some circumstantial evidence. Uh, the police chief at the time uh, was also kind of on the way out and he was told, he heard that the individual was thinking about leaving town. Uh, so he said, you know, let's just let him leave town, see if the fire stop. We got to get some relief. Yeah. So he was the police chief and we were there to help him. So uh, he left and the fire stopped. About um, probably three or four years later, I got a phone call from my captain at the time and asked me if I knew the name Benjamin Harris. And I said, Dude, that's the individual we thought was setting the fires in Walterboro. He said, well, he's in jail right now in Florida. He has set some more fires, and he wants to talk about the ones in Walterboro. So I drove to uh, Fort Pierce, Florida, down to Lake Okeechobee, and over a period of two days, I interviewed him, and he confessed to every fire that we had, except for the one that we had left to arrest him on. The last fire, he would not confess to. I don't really? know why, but he would not confess to it. But the rest of them he confessed to, um, and – he ended up serving about, I think, 11 or 12 years in federal prison for the fires he set in Florida. And when he got ready to come out, be released, we went and picked him up and brought him back up here to answer for the fires that he'd set in Walterboro. And um, the judge decided that he had served enough time for the fires and he let him out. And uh, he immediately went to start setting more fires. He set more fires and was arrested again. And he is now, at last I was told, he's in the, in the VA hospital and not doing very well. He's probably not going to be with us much longer. But um, he set, like I said, probably between 20 and 25 fires in Walterboro during those, those two years. Oh, wow. Uh, now, I wonder why he didn't want to accept responsibility for the one. Was there more damage or was it somebody there was the last one? It was less damage. I don't know if it was just a pride thing that that was when we had enough on to arrest him for. Okay. Um, we, we were wondering, you know, there was no real connection between the victims uh, when the fires were being set. Um, he even set his parents' house on fire twice, one time within a minute, but it was a very small fire and it didn't do much damage. We found out later um, that every fire he set, he had a problem. He had an issue with the victims. Even if it was a, the slightest, if he felt the, the slightest bit offended by them. Yeah. He didn't address, he didn't, he didn't aggress toward them. He just burned their stuff down. He burned her house down or burned their vehicles. Um, that's how he dealt with his issues. He just set fire. Burn it. Burn um, it. <laughs> um, I don't know why it's not telling us the user's names. Uh, if, if you haven't um, accepted that uh, your name can be shared, I think that that's the reason why, but um so this Facebook user says, uh, what's the most common reason for being an arsonist? Property damage, killing or hurting people, or like in this case of American Fire, boredom. So the biggest reason, the biggest motive for, for arson is, is financial gain. Uh, if we have a fire at a house, you know, and we determine it's, it's incendiary or intentionally set fire to arson, um, the first people we look at are the homeowners, because generally it's done for insurance purposes. Um, if it's not for insurance purposes, then and if it's intentionally set, you got one of a few reasons. There are not many motives for arson. Um, you got profit is the main one. Um, you have uh, uh, domestic 
related fires, husband and wife not getting along, one seeing someone else sneaking around. And a lot of times uh, that happens, that causes fires as well. <laughs> um, crime concealment. If somebody burglarizing a building, don't want to get caught or, or kill somebody, they'll try to burn it down thinking they'll destroy the evidence. Well, thankfully, you know, a lot of times it does. not Sometimes it does, but a lot of time it doesn't. Um, and then you have someone that's just, you know, a pyromaniac, um, someone that sets fire. Some some do it for sexual gratification. They just they enjoy the fire and they um, some do it for um, excitement. That's excitement motive. You have some people that do it um, for a hero. Uh, a lot of times you have volunteer volunteer firemen to set fires and then they find the fires and they get to put, put the fires out. Um, that is very, very common, unfortunately, that, that we We've arrested a lot of volunteer firemen over the day and some full-time firemen for doing that very thing. That's just crazy. Well, I didn't remotely prepare you for this, but what, what are the kind of stati statistics for ar true arson in South Carolina? Are there a lot of uh, in, that are serial arson? So serial, like I said, I've, I've worked too in about 20 years. Uh, we, we probably had, you know, a handful more than that that I've not been directly involved with. Um, the second serial arsonist I worked, and I say serial arsonist, he he set multiple fires, so I think he'll fall into that, that category. Um, he was in Orangeburg, and he um, he burned down two houses a, a week apart, and he did that because he was planning on burning his house, and he wanted to look like a victim in the series of three arsons, but he was actually the one doing it. He was going through a divorce, and his wife had the money, and he wanted to burn his house down and get the insurance money. Thankfully, his wife started working with us and we figured out that it was him. And we put a camera on his house, started catching him, do some vandalism at his own house. We saw him slash his tires. He was just doing making his police reports and that he was a victim. He was a victim. He was a victim. And eventually we actually set up a, a sting operation and we actually watched him set fire to his own house, which was Oh, wow. It was that, that was pretty interesting. Um, he served 15 years, um, and there's a, a interesting thing about that actually in the book. Um, that when I read it, it made me think about what happened here. On page 133, he's talking about when they were watching him set the fire that they caught him on. He said to himself, "The house has to catch fire." Okay, so that that's pretty important because for a while they changed the arson laws. Um, and you had to have uh, a certain amount of damage. Well, the, the point when this guy set the house on fire, you had to have actual chemical change. So it had to be charred or melted. OK. Um, and when he set fire to the house, we went down, of course, and, and put it out to protect the evidence. And we almost put it out too fast because he had a the only thing he set on fire that, that caught on fire was actually the threshold of his back door. And it burned a spot about the size of a half dollar. It melted and charred the plastic on the floor. If we hadn't had that, we could have charged him with arson. But that one little, that one little spot was enough to sow chemical change, and it, sure. and we got 15 years out of him for that one small circle. Um, uh, somebody did want to say, did he try to deny it? He he did try to deny it, and the story goes on. So um, we caught him that night. We arrested him. We charged him with all three of the fires and this guy was, he was, he was, uh, he was pretty determined. Uh, the judge gave him an ankle monitor, let him back out. The only place in the world he was not allowed to go was his own neighborhood. That's the only place he couldn't go. Well, about a few weeks later, I got a call about four in the morning and he said, hey, you're not going to believe it. His house is on the ground. He went back and burned it down to the ground. Oh my God. And we charged him with that one as well. And um, so the judge said, we took him to the judge and the judge said, look, if you if you plead guilty, if you plead, if I find you guilty on even one of these fires, I'm going to give you 25 years on all four of them. So that's yeah, 100 years. He said, if you plead guilty, I get 15 years. So he pled guilty and got 15 years and, and he got in trouble. He was in prison too. He's now out back in Orangeburg, Roman streets. And um, he served his time. They served 15 years. Um. <laughs> Of course, he went back, silly goose. <laughs> um, um, and this is a, a, a question I had, too. Uh, maybe uh, is there a personality type for arsonists? So uh, the profiles, you know, they 
they talk about profiles and stuff. It's been my experience, and it, depend, it depends on the, the motive for why they're setting the fire. If it's financial, you know, they could just be needing some money. I mean, it happens all the time. Um, your, serials are, your serial arsonists, you know, I typically, you know, I would, I would probably classify them as, um, as loners. They don't have very good social skills. And this is the way they deal with, with things, with issues. They just, they set things on fire and it makes them feel better. It makes them, it gives them like a release. Um, so loners, not very um, socially um, acceptable at all. They're just, they're very introverted. They're quiet. And this is how they, this is how they communicate a lot of times. With fire. Um, as, as Katie says, wow. <laughs> it is, wow. The guy, um, the guy we locked up in, in Walterboro, he actually had tattoos of fire on both of his, his shoulders, fireballs. Oh. So he was, he was, he was an interesting I, fellow. I, I didn't want to, you know, focus in on that police chief, but really the thought process behind saying, okay, well, maybe he could just leave us and maybe go set fire somewhere else just seems bizarre to me. It, is, it was kind <laughs> it was of bizarre. Like, okay. Let's not, let's not actually, you know, put him to trial. And even though we only have him for one, let's put him in jail to find out if, if the arson stopped. Let's no, just let him go to another town. <laughs> yes, ma'am. That's a, that's a long time ago. when, like I said, he wreaked so much havoc on that town. The town was just, they just, they were, they, were just, they had to have some relief. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm a firm believer. Things have a way of working themselves out. Um, it was funny how we got caught in Florida. Actually, he, he set, this is not funny, but he set a, an RV on fire. It was in an RV park, like a new RV thing. And it, that's why he got federal time because it, the amount of dollar amount that he damaged caused. But how we actually got caught was he, in Florida, apparently it's a felony to discharge a fire extinguisher if there's no fire. Okay. Oh. He got on his, on his front stoop and just shh, shh, a fire extinguisher. And someone complained about it. So they went and talked to him. And they ended up getting a search warrant or consent, whatever they got. And they got in his trunk of his car and he had burglary tools. And from there, it just started snowballing. And he just, he confessed to, to everything. I mean, he just, he let it all, he let it all go. So you could go to jail or have a fine at least for shooting off a fire extinguisher. In Florida, you can. Florida. That's in Florida, crazy. you can. Um, uh, here, uh, somebody wanted to know, do kids set fire as much as adults? I'm not sure the the ratio. Kids do set fires. Um, when kids set fires, you know, a lot of kids play with fire when they're little because they're, they're just interested by it. They're fascinated by it. I don't know why. Um, but you have to, you know, as far as charging a child, you have to have motive to charge fire with arson. A lot of kids don't have motive. They're just interested or just experiment and trying to see what it's about. Um, but kids set fires all the time. Um, we have arrested uh, young teenagers for setting fires. If it's a bad enough fire, if they set enough of them or if someone's injured, they, they are charged as well. Right. But most of the times if they're younger, it's just a, we were playing. Yes, ma'am. With fire kind of situation. And there've been times when a, when a child has set a fire and their sibling has, has died. Um, and, and that's, that's tragic. It's extremely tragic. It's horrible. But if there's no intent, we can't prove intent for that child. I mean, you yeah. know, it's just, we can't do anything about that. Um, Stephanie wanted to know, are your investigators involved when someone sets forest fires or is it only when those fires damage property? That's a great question. So we do not investigate the call. They're called wildland fires is what the, the term is. Um, the South Carolina Forestry Commission has a law enforcement branch and they investigate their experts in wild on fires. We, we don't, we're not trained in that. Um, they do it. They do a very good job of, of this completely different um, way to investigate a wild and fire than a structure fire. And we don't do that. And we've helped them from time to time, but they're the experts in that field. Um. One, uh, considering the human effort involved in fighting and investigating these fires, um, the author told us that 41,000 man hours were involved. Uh, what impressed you most about the authorities' responses, and would you have done anything differently? 
So it was an incredible response in the book um, from the state police, the, uh, the ATF, all the agencies that came down, the Virginia State Police. Um, if we had a situation like that, like in, in Walter, for example, we didn't have anybody but sled agents and local police were investigating it. We had probably that year and a half of 25 cases. There was probably um, four or five agents that went down there and each, each of us had several cases assigned to us and it's dependent on who went down there for which fires is who got assigned what. Um, once we figured out they were all connected by the same person, then we got together and we, of course, you know, we, we did our paperwork together and, and got the, uh, the ball rolling on that. But in today's time, we, if we have a situation like this with that many fires, we would, we would definitely involve our partners from all over the state. We would involve the local law enforcement, the sheriff's office, the police departments, the local fire departments. Um, we would probably notify, get state fire involved, uh, state fire marshal's office. Um, and we have great relationships with our federal partners as well. The ATF does a lot with us. Um, they're helping us on fires all the time to, to try to help us. They have a lot more resources than we do. Um, you might remember the, the post office that was, that burned up here in Anderson not too long ago. Um, if you have a fire of that magnitude, we've had them several across the state throughout the years. The, um, ATF will send out our team, the national response team, the NRT, and they'll have folks from all over the world come in and help us investigate fires. That we have people that do nothing but uh, engineers come and look at the building. We have people that do nothing but um, different different investigative techniques. They have a, teams come all over the world to help us with these things. Well, do you, is the availability and the um, of the various different groups? Is it more attainable now than it was then because it was 20 years ago that y'all, the, the Walterboro fires? Sure. So uh, I mean, we, like, has that, has the different groups? We could have used uh, the ATF back then, but the fires that were being set, they were, there were some total losses, but there were a lot of just little, little small fires that didn't do much damage because uh, he used available, he didn't use any flammable, he used a, he used a cardboard box, whatever was available to us, what he would use. Um, nobody was ever injured as a result of one of his fires, thankfully. Um, they were all just property damage. Um, we have, we've had NRT call outs, the national response team call outs um, by the post office. We had one, um, the Black Chamber of Commerce in Beaufort was burned. It was not, it was not criminal, thankfully. We determined it was an electrical fire. Um, but anything of a great magnitude, um, we had a guy that set a factory on fire in Holly Hill, South Carolina. That was a call out just because we need more manpower because they can provide cranes, uh, heavy yeah. equipment operators free of charge to us. That doesn't cost us anything. And we can't, that's very expensive to get in there and start doing that. You start taking walls off of a building. I mean, it's, it's, that's a big deal. It's a very involved process. Um, we had a question. Somebody wanted to know uh, what was the post office? Um, you know, who started that post office fire? Um, I, I came up for a day on that fire. I'm not exactly sure. And that fire, if it was criminal, it's still pending. So I can't discuss okay. the, the details of that fire, but, um, um, I'm fairly certain they have it narrowed down to what and who started that fire. Okay. Um, it, and, um, a group in the book, a group of profilers descended on Accomack County. Um, do you think that all of these various groups and profilers were helpful in solving this crime. I'm sure they were. You, you read in the book, some were kind of frustrated because they, yeah. you know, they kept happening. Um, we have profilers at SLED. We have a team, the BSU Behavioral Science Unit, and they're incredible. They're very good at what they do. Um, I've used them a handful of times over my 20 years. The first time I used them was actually on a, it was a fire homicide in Orangeburg. Um, we had an elderly male, uh, elderly black male that was, um, it was horrific. He was beaten, stabbed, shot, and set on fire. And oh my God. Um, we, we had the profilers come and looked at the case, talked to us about it. And, and he said, you, you need to be looking for, you know, a certain demographic, a certain age. And, and A, B, and C were probably involved in this. And he hit every, this person, our suspect that is now in prison for life, hit every single one of those marks, every single one of them. There was, there were co-defendants. So it was a boyfriend, girlfriend, and, Everything they said we should be looking for, 
was was what had happened. So it was amazing. So another couple. Yes, so ma'am. Sometimes couples are just no good. Yeah. No good at all. That is, oh, that's horrific. Um, is there a typical, I think we kind of talked about this already, a typical art, arsonist profile? Did Charlie and Tanya fit that profile? I, I think we can um, cover it. There's not really, a, I would call a typical profile. There probably is, but I'm not a profiler. I can tell you that in my experience, I've arrested um, almost every demographic for setting fires. Like I said, it depends on the motive of why they're doing it. Um, consistently, our arson arrest stats for SLED, consistently our biggest violators are white males. Are white males. Um, with the white males, does it tend to be insurance related? Like with the gentleman who was trying it to- It could be anything. I've arrested white males for uh, arson for profit. I've arrested them for homicide. Um, domestic related homicide, I've arrested them for uh, uh, firefighters, for excitement, um, damage to property, you, you name it. They, they, they run the whole gamut of, of reasons why. Uh, what about age groups? Um, Usually, I would say um, it's going to be a kind of a, not a real narrow group. I'd say 18 to 30 is, is probably the, the most common age group. Um, but we've arrested senior citizens. We've arrested really? kids. You know, we had a lady um, and in Lexington County that was, was set a bunch of small grass fires. And she did it. She served time for it, got out, and started doing it again. She just got arrested again. She just got sentenced again. Probably a month ago to 15 years in prison. She just likes setting little small grass fires. Just just because it was fun. I think she's got some uh, probably some behavioral issues she's dealing with. Um, well, I just to uh, share with the people that um, may not have uh, read the book or seen the um, people uh, that actually started these fires, I did just kind of want to show a few um, of the headlines of the Virginia newspapers that were, you know, in for this specific case in Accomack County. Um, this was just a, a few of the, um, sorry. Um, these are the, the police and fire people that were uh, investigating it. Um, one of the horrific burns. Um, and then this is the couple that actually set all these fires. Um, Charles Smith and Tanya um, Bundick. Um, and even though they were small fires, there's a list of all of the victims of the arsons. Um, and in those cases too, it did turn out to be to where they, um, Tanya had a slight with most of the people that were on the, you know, some of them were just random, but some of the people are, from what I gathered, were that she had been slighted or she, yes, she had been slighted by them. Um, she went through some interesting looks while she was going through her, uh, I like the cornrows. Um, and I love this. He said it was just something we always did. And just that, you know. Um, and just to kind of show you who these, and this is kind of the time frame. Um, 2012 is when it started, and they finally were sentenced by 2014. Um, but their the fires were from November 12th to April 2nd. So, um, but yeah, so that I just kind of wanted to show you some of those people. Uh, all right. Any other thing uh, that threw you um, in the invest investigation, um, how they went after the two convicted? You mean in the court system or how they actually caught them? Uh, how they caught them. Yeah, how they caught them. So, yeah, that's how it happens. You know, you, you put hundreds and hundreds of man hours into, into investigating these things and all of a sudden, Sometimes it's just, you look up. I mean, they happened to be there and they had the cameras out and they had, um, 
they had a good idea of where it might be the next one, you know, based on previous fires. Um, and sometimes you make your own luck. And they were obviously out there working, trying to find it, beating the bush, trying to find out who was doing this. And they just happened to be the right place at the right time. Um, you know, when we caught the guy in Orangeburg, we, he ran out of the house that I set on fire. We caught him down in the woods and he just, um, we just happened to be there when it happened. So sometimes it works out that way. And it, it, it is, it, it, it's still kind of also crazy in my mind that even though you set up the sting, it actually had to have burnt to a certain level. Yes, ma'am. For him to be charged with arson. Yes, at that point, now now you can have smoke damage. If it smokes up any, anything at all, now they change the law about how it should be. Um, you can charge it with arson. And there, are three, there are three different levels of arson. Arson first degree, second degree, and third degree. Um, so arson, arson second degree is the most common. That's like um, any structure you can live in or commercial building. Um, arson third degree is like a vehicle or a shed or a boat. Um, and arson first degree is any fire where somebody is seriously injured or killed. Um, that's arson first degree. Um, so arson first degree carries up to 30 years in prison. Because if someone's killed, it's, it's, it ends up being murder as well. You can charge them with both. Arson second carries 25 years. And arson third degree carries 15 years in, in jail. Or prison, rather. Um, Stephanie said that does seem to be a lot of revenge fires. Um yep. There are, I've worked some revenge fires. Um, the fires that we worked that we've determined to be arson, um, by and large have been financially motivated. That's, that's the most common, that's the most common. Um, and then uh, someone wanted to know, do most arsons get solved? That's a great question. No, they don't. Um, the, the national average clearance rate by arrest for arsons is between 18 and 22%. Oh, wow. Because in order to determine if you have an arson, you got to find out where the fire started. First, you have to find out if you can have a crime by looking at the fire scene. And if you don't have enough to look at, if the building is too damaged to determine where the fire originated, you can't tell what, if you can't find the origin of the fire, you can't find the cause of the fire. Okay, so we do what's called an origin and cause investigation. Determine the origin of the fire first, where it actually started, what were the first ignited materials, and then we can try to figure out what caused it or who caused it. Um, so we are, um, our arson guys at SLED are incredible. I'm so proud of them. Um, so the national average rate is between 18 and 22 percent for clearance, right? Mm -hmm. Ours has been as high as 60, 65 percent. Oh, wow. Um, right now, we're, we're ranging between 35 and 45 percent clearance rate by arrest. Um, How many arsons do we have in South Carolina? Well, we have arsons. I can't tell you that number, but I can tell you right now, um, my teams have investigated 163 fires so far this year. Uh -huh. Now, we're not called every fire to investigate. And a lot of the fires we go to, we can't determine if it's arson or not because there's so much damage done. So you have a few different classifications of fires. Um, you have uh, accidental. An accidental fire is a fire that would be um, if you cook it on the stove and you have a grease fire. That's an accidental fire, okay? Yeah. Or if you have a child, you know, play with matches. I mean, that's that's actually not an accident. It's a, it's a human act. Um, a natural fire it would be a lightning strike. Okay. A lightning strike causes a lot of fires. Um you have undetermined, which is the the bulk of them fall undetermined because if you can't determine the first ignited material and the sequence of events that led to the fire, you can't classify it. It has to be undetermined. And then the fourth type is incendiary or arson fire. If they involve an incendiary, is that much easier to determine that yes, it is? I mean, not always. Um, it depends on how they do it. A lot of people, thankfully, um, they don't know much about fire okay. and that helps us investigate it. Um, if they start to fire sometimes and shut the door, I've had several where that puts the fire out. Uh, you have to have oxygen, have a fire. If there's no oxygen, then once the fire burns the oxygen up, the fire goes out. So if they don't know, understand fire dynamics, when they shut that door, um, all the evidence is in that room. So it's a lot easier to determine if they know what they're doing 
or just get lucky sometimes you burn the whole house down and there's nothing left. If you have a, a mobile home that's burned and all you have left is the tin roof and two rails, it's hard to tell where that fire started. That's going to be a lot harder to solve than something we got a lot more to look at. Well, uh, for like for the lady who was setting grass fires, what is left of that? <laughs> Do it, ma'am. I'm sorry. The, the lady who was setting grass fires, what is left to where you can determine? Well, you'd have an area burnt. You'd have like a, you know, you could have like a two or 300 square foot area that, that's burnt. Uh, um, that didn't, you know, the fire department come out and put the fire out, but you can see exactly on a grass fire where the fire burned. Okay. So and, it, it, in its blankness, it still kind of told the story. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Absolutely. Especially you have, you know, we ended up catching on camera, we put out cameras and, and we oh. caught her. Uh, that's how we, we ended up catching her. Um. Another person agree. Stephanie says, "If it, it seems like if you intended to do damage and there is any damage, you should be charged." And you said that that is the case now in South. That's Carolina. right. Yes, ma'am. Okay, that's good. Um, several wows. Very interesting. Great job. And I'm I'm pretty positive the great job came with the South Carolina stats for arson. That oh, so I'm very very proud of my folks. Yeah, as you should be. Um, makes me feel better. Um, over the years, have the materials people use to start fires changed? Have arsonists gotten better at hiding their tracks with certain materials? I think there have, there have always been clever people that have always going to find a way to do it, to try to be, you know, one step ahead of us. Um, but like I said, if there's something that can be found, my guys are going to find it. My guys and girls are going to find it. We, we're just, they're awesome at what they do. <laughs> Um, you know, people set fires with common materials, combustible materials. I use cardboard, use, you know, paper, hay, um, whatever they can, they can find readily available. Some people use flammable or combustible materials, gas, kerosene, lighter fluid. Um, we have ways of detecting that as well. We have arson, we have accelerant detection canines, we have dogs, arson dogs. Um, we have handheld equipment that, that can detect the presence of hydrocarbons. Um, if we feel we have something of evidence, um, we'll take it to the lab and they'll run it to their machines and, and they can tell if it's there, what it is. Um, so we have a lot of ways we can determine as well if something was used flammable or combustible to start the fire. Is that, is that by odor? The dogs? The dogs and the, the handheld, whatever? Um, the dogs is odor. Yes, ma'am. The handheld mach machines, um, I'm not exactly sure how they work, but I know they work. Um, <laughs> the, the dogs... Canines are incredible. Yeah. Um, the way it was explained to me, this I think is a really good picture. So when you walk into a house, right, and someone's baked a cake, you smell the cake, right? Yeah, yeah. A dog smells the flour, the sugar, mm. the vanilla. That's how specific a dog's nose is. That's how incredible they are. So a dog can, can – and sometimes even if the dog alerts – I'm going to say there's something there. Now, our machines might not be able to find it because a dog's nose is so finely tuned that if, if a dog alerts, that there's a very good chance something was there. I, I, I watched some of that series with all the, the canines. The yes, ma'am. Amazing, <laughs> amazing dogs or you know, all the, the trained canines. And it's just, it is amazing what those animals can do. Just a reminder, anybody who's watching, if you have any questions, enter it and you could be, um, and we'll get uh, Captain... Craig to answer your questions and you'll be entered to win a coffee. Um, somebody else wanted to know uh, for the lady that was burning grass, was it her property? It was not her property. Not her property. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And Kate said, what led you to chose your career and what led you to working in arson investigations? Well, since I was a little boy, I was going to be a police officer. I never grew out of it. That's all I ever wanted to do. Um, and as I got older, um, I decided I wanted to work at SLED. They had a great reputation. And that my career my career goal was to be a lieutenant at SLED. That's all I wanted to do. And um, I graduated from Appalachian State in December of 1994. I started the police academy in January of 95. And I've been policing ever since. Um, I started in arson while I was with the York County Sheriff's Office. I was able to go to the two-week, at the time, the two-week basic arson school. And... I went to that school and I started helping our detective with the sheriff's office with fire investigations and 
that was a way that I saw to get into SLED was fire investigation. I knew they had a, a full-time arson team. And that's what I got hired to SLED to do was in arson investigations. And it's kind of come full circle. Like I said, I started there as an agent investigating fires. And now I'm the special agent in charge of the whole unit. So it's uh, it's been, I've been very blessed with my career. I've, I've, I've had a great career. Well, it sounds like we're lucky to have you in that great career. Um, somebody else wanted to know, how long do, does a dog train for fire detection? Uh, I think the school they go to is about it's either three or four weeks long, depending on the dog and the handler. Um, and actually, the we started sending our folks. Uh, I think the last dog we got, we they came up to Greenville. There's a, a company in Greenville that does a fantastic job training canines of all different disciplines. And um, we sent them up here now. Since you do wear so many hats, are your dogs multi-disciplined trained? Our arson dogs are not. Now, sled has canines. We have canines. We have a tracking dog. We have bloodhounds that track. We have uh, apprehension dogs that bite. We have narcotics dogs that find drugs. We have uh, bomb dogs, and we have arson dogs. And I think that's, I think that's all the ones we have at sled. How many dogs do you have? Okay. We have three arson dogs. We have one in the upstate. We have one in. Um, on the coast and we have one in the low country. Um, and Kristen did want to just say thank you for your service. Very it really well. is it's good. It's good to have good people in uh, the right spots to be able to clearly, you know what you're doing and you're training <laughs> the next generation arson investigators Yes, ma'am. Uh, to keep those numbers. Um, and the, the, the results. Uh, I losing my mind now. Sorry. <laughs> Basically, making us above the average. Absolutely. In national average. So, um, any other questions before we draw the winner? Okay. Let me, um, I am going to uh, get the the, the names of those who have asked questions from Jennifer and we will draw the winner. Hang on one second. <laughs> All right. Okay. And the winner of the Ninja Warrior Coffee House is Katie. Katie, thank you so much for um asking your questions. Thank you everybody for joining us. And thanks again, um, Captain, <laughs> Captain Craig. I don't know why I keep <laughs> what I'm calling you, <laughs> but I thank you so much for joining us. You're very welcome. We really do appreciate it. Um, and I hope you have a wonderful holiday season. And again, thank you everyone who joined us. Um, and oh, we'll see you next time with thank Coffee you, and Crumb. Thanks.